So I, I haven't got anything done this week. Uh, they turned my fiber optic internet on, so I wasted time on that. And it's not really helping me out. Um, I was going to load up a new computer, and I haven't got around to that either. And I looked at some of Al's stuff. And Al and I were just discussing the fact that we could go into the simulator and try to break the simulator to make it do what his is doing right now. So instead of having a perfect position, we could take the actual GPS it creates and run it through the programs he's running and see if that affects anything. So that's something we can either talk about, either talk about today or, or later. We can we can discuss how to do that kind of stuff. And other than that, I don't think I have anything, anything else to, to report. So I'll turn it over. Let me take it off the. Um, I put out in Slack sort of my some of my steps. Oh, come on up in there, Mr. Slack. And so, one of the suggestions that Jeff had made previously was to just run a path with, you know, a turn on one end and a turn on the other end and straight lines in between. Um, as you can see here, this it, it's not staying on well. It's a very inefficient way of going on that straight path. Um, and so that's what the focus has been recently is trying to figure out why that was. One of the um, one of the potential areas was the, the GPS that's in front of base link or the center of the rear axle, about 20 inches and it's offset a little bit to the right. And I had some calculations in there to take the GPS line and then back into, so to speak, or apply that offset to get to the base link setting in order to pu publish the ODOM statement. That, um, I've spent time looking at that program. I thought it was going to pull it up here. Um, what you're seeing is a page out of my Miro whiteboard. And I just got a message about high CPU utilization. So that's probably about too much going on here. Anyway. Um, What I was trying to get to is a program that I'd written, which I'd also published to um, try to ensure that I've got that right calculation. And Jeff and I collaborated a little bit on the whiteboard to make sure that that was representing the actual offset. So that's been applied. And I'm still getting this wavy behavior. So at the moment, what I've been spending time on is looking at other people's pure pursuit implementations and trying to back into how they've actually done that calculation and compare it to what we're doing. And hopefully um, I'll add some more data gathering statements to the programs to try to catch some of the interim calculations being done. I have, by the way, done multiple tests on different look ahead settings and different steps, which is the gap in the waypoints. Um, unfortunately, to no avail, the, the steering is still waiting. So my next step is to keep looking at this pure pursuit thing and seeing if it's, seeing if I can figure out why it's so waiting. One question you would be logical to ask is, you know, are you sure your GPS is accurate? And I, again, not here. Well, there it is. Thank you for being this. Um, this is software that's provided by the manufacturer of the GPS, which happens to be a company called um, Comtech. And it's small here, but um, this is showing a radius of the, the actual GPS when it has RTK fix of being 0 
meters radius. So if you do the math, I think that's within an inch or so. Um, so it's not the GPS. And my steering, you might say, well, could it be the steering? At the moment, I can drive the tractor around manually, and I use the same PID controller to drive manually as I do when I'm in automatic mode. And you know, the steering is fine when it's being driven around manually. So although it could be, um, it's not, you know, my focus at the moment is not, you know, on the physical steering or the physical GPS. I'm somewhere in the software, I think, is where my issue lies. So my debug process, I'm certainly open to suggestions. My debug process at the moment is to understand the peer pursuit uh, algorithm better and look for opportunities to plot more data to try to figure out if I can see why it thinks it needs to, you know, trigger a hard right and a hard left instead of something a lot smoother or, or simpler. I've even gone back to, let's see if it's up here. No, I don't know if I have it up here. Um, Oh yeah, I've even gone back to the 1992 original <laughs> um, write-up on Peer Pursuit, um, which is when it evidently came out of these guys. So that's where I'm at. I'm hoping to make progress. I'm sure we'll get there. It's just a matter of uh, tuning and getting the configuration right, he says, hopefully. That's it. You try driving manually around that path. So start up pure pursuits with running, but just ignore it. You know, leave your switch set to manual and just drive around your loop a couple of times. Then you go back and look at the data coming out. So you can see how pure pursuit is reacting to you driving on what you think is the correct path and see if you have any weird numbers showing up there that, you know, is your GPS not where it's supposed to be or is it you know, your IMU or whatever you're using, you can look at those values. And if there's any waviness to those values, then then that's probably the the culprit that's coming into it. No is the answer to your question. I haven't tried to drive that exact path manually while having a peer pursuit run. So I, I can certainly try that. But that might tell you something right there, just the fact that you know you know where it's supposed to be and you know what it's supposed to be doing, but then go look at the values coming out that pure pursuit is generating. It's got both that cross track error and then it's got the the steering request number and see what see how those are tracking. As long as you're right on the line, pointed right at, you know, right at the end of the end of the line you're driving to, you know, it should be saying, give me a steering angle of zero. You get off a little bit, it'll try to correct back. And it shouldn't be doing anything you know, real anything really wild there. Because somehow you're getting in some kind of a feedback loop as it starts turning one way and then it, it says, oh, I've got too far and then it cranks it all over the other way. So there's just something funny going on there that we don't know if it's sensor data coming in that's making it do that or, I don't know, loop rates. There's, there's all kinds of things probably that could, that could cause that. But I'm just thinking if you drive at least once manually and save that so you can go back and refer to that and say, yeah, but here's what it's doing at that point and then try to figure out, you know, try to figure out from there. You know, one thing that I was concerned about that sort of related was was the transform position. Um, what I thought it should be, and because I, quite honestly, before today, I was thinking, hey, I've got a transform problem. I probably screwed something up there, um, and I could, still could, but I did check the transform, and it, you know, the transform is saying matches the ODOM data as far as what's the position of, of the robot. So, but I still think your your test would be a good one to see if it sheds any light on or if it's getting the same basic performance for calculations anyway. And speaking of transform, when I went and looked at that pure pursuit code, I saw that they, I think they're subscribing to a ODOM topic and they're subscribing to some kind of a heading 
I don't remember what, if that was coming, if they said it's come from the IMU or you supplied anything you want, but then also says it goes out and looks at the transform tree. I thought I saw a comment that says we, we need, we need some information from ODOM, but we actually get it from the, the transform instead, in which case that I don't know why they're using the ODOM topic. So it could be that it's looking at something you're not expecting there. And I, as I just briefly saw that and haven't tracked that down any farther to see what they're, what they're actually doing there. Yeah, I'll go back and look. I the um, so I, I can't with one hundred percent certainty, you know, quote the code, but um, I'll go back and double check, double check to see if I can find the comment that you came across. And it's just the point that if it's trying to use something you don't realize, it could be the, the thing you don't realize is just wrong. So maybe that if you can figure out what pieces it's actually using, then you can go track those down and see if that see if that is a problem or not. <clears throat> if that makes sense. It does. The other thing I'll just mention is that you know, I got the pure pursuit code from Juan's, you know, copy of his workspace. Um, I think I found the original creator of that and, you know, went to look at their repository to see if there were any issues or anything like that. And, um, you know, there really wasn't anything, hasn't been touched in three years. And then I looked at, you may or may not remember, um, there was a university guy who started a one tenth radio club um, race car. Basically, he took an RC car that was one tenth scale, started what he called the F1 one tenth competition, and they had published their code. Again, hadn't been updated in um, years, but it was another implementation of pure pursuit. So at least it was something public and somebody had used it and made it work. And I was trying to understand their pure pursuit calculations. They're not all the same. I mean, <laughs> he used trigonometry. The guy that we're using is using vector math. Um, so it's interesting people's different implementations of the pure pursuit. That's why I went back to the 19th 92 paper to see, well, what did you guys actually say? Um, anyway, that's just been a part of the journey. Yeah, I briefly looked at that original paper and didn't get too far into it. I, I was at the point I wasn't trying to figure out how the thing worked. I just saw that it said it was based on that. And I pulled it up to make sure I had it and hadn't really done any more with it than that. So that's where I'm at. Um, Miro, I, I mean, I'll close Slack and bring it Miro. Maybe it will work a little bit better without Slack running on my machine. Um, I, um, uh, I better share my screen. I don't think I'm sharing. So in trying to get organized a little bit, um, I'm open to suggestions, but at the moment I've just got this long list of, you know, important things that have come across that I've used. Um, and at the moment I've just got this list. And so I'm interested in input on how might this list get organized so that I can then organize the links and subsequently the, the Miro data. But anyway, it still continues to be, I think, a useful tool for sort of providing a visual and a summary of the documentation. And it's out there for, for view for anybody who cares to um, look at it. Oh, there's the link to the... GPS offset. And so that's just one of the ways that Miro works is you can provide a link and it goes to a particular section and 
this was the putting in some values and getting the baseline point and the GPS point and trying to do that for three or four different yaw headings. And Jeff made a good suggestion about my documentation wasn't so great, so I made it try to make it a little bit better there. Then on Miro, you can then go back to the long list of documentation, so you can get a from and to sort of thing going. Anywho. So one other thing you might want to try, you know, I was I was mentioning if you you plot out the the point where where the GPS is and plot where it thinks base link is, if you just go into that that code where you're doing the those corrections, and just create, you know, once you you pull up the GPS data, go ahead and publish that as an ODOM statement. I, you probably don't need the full ODOM. You just you probably need the X fill in the X Y values on that and publish that and call it something like GPS ODOM, and then after you convert. To, to base link that your normal ODOM statement, go ahead and publish that. So when you go back and drive around, um, the next time you go out and do your testing, you'll have those values. So you can plot them both on the screen at the same time. So it puts the little the little dots on the screen as you drive around, because that that's immediately obvious if it's not in the right spot. You can see you can see those two points moving around and they should they should be fixed. You know, as you drive around, you've got here's uh of course, everything's backwards. So here's your here's your here's your GPS. Then base link is actually down down here somewhere. As you drive around, those should remain, you know, no matter what angle you at, those should have the same orientation between those. And if they don't, for some reason, if one is uh, going as you turn and one of them goes the wrong direction or whatever, you know, it, it's going to be obvious very quickly. You just it, it'll be, should be immediately obvious that there's something something funny going on there. <clears throat> And I think right now you, I, I don't think you are publishing the GPS at all, unless you go back, you can probably go back. Um, oh, oh, the other thing I was just pointing out yesterday, I was, I was trying to plot your, the slash fix out of your bag file, which I assumed was the, the NAVSAT fix that has latitude and longitude. And sure enough, it has fields for those, but it only had, it had zero and it had 40 in there. I didn't see anything like a 93 dot blah, 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 that, that, you know, I didn't see any latitude and longitude values in there. So I don't know what that was I was looking at, but I I didn't go any farther because I had no idea how you created that or what it's supposed to be. So so one, another thing I was going to point out is that if you just go out and plot, plot latitude and longitude and, and it shows up on the screen, you know, right now you've got this thing showing up where you got this vertical line here and a loop at the top and then a loop at the bottom down here. And if you're... If you're looking at a GPS, it, it it may plot like this or it may plot sideways like this. And that's because you have to look at, say, well, latitude is actually vertical and longitude is actually horizontal. And then you got the concept of X and Y and then on your map frame, you know, where's north and where's east and all this kind of stuff. So it, it's hard to, you know, it, for me, it's hard to wrap my head around all these different directions and rotations and all that stuff. And what, what was the other thing on that? Uh, oh, so, so when you go to plot it on... Um, plot juggler you can say click on latitude and longitude and right click it and drag it over and it says oh do you want do you want to do you want to swap those values and if you do then that'll if, if it's plotting like this and you don't want it that way you, you could get it to plot like this by swapping the values and now the question is do those line up with your x y values you know once you do all your translation i, I assume right now by looking at your plots that i've seen so far that that basically north is positive x on you know the way it's plotted in plot juggler and you know, does that match? Is, is the correct rotation from GPS? And it probably is because all your stuff is is everything's working great, except that it's got that waviness to the uh, the line that's trying to create. So that was just something something else odd. I thought, well, I'll just plot the latitude and longitude and see what that looks like. But when I went to plot it, that's not what was in there, and I don't know. So I don't know how your stuff is working if you don't have those values going through there. Yeah, everything's great except it's steering is terrible. Um... So if I just take and I looked at a couple different bag files, and that seemed to be what was in them. So I just take something from yesterday. And so it does have this fix. Um, and I see on the side there it does say that it's a navsat fix message. So that 
is i i thought that is what should be in there and and i mean my let's call it the ground truth is odom position and this i mean as normal i'm just going to click those you know shift and then right click and drag them over and as you said you can swap those i've never on this i've never swapped um, and I get, you know, the path that I just ran. Now, if I go into fix, because when you said I had bad data, you know, I'm like, well, I don't think I have bad data. But then I realize this is just latitude, by the way. Um, Mine just simply either had zero or it had 40, an integer 40. It didn't have anything that looked, you know, reasonable data. So I don't know what it was. If I was looking at the wrong thing or when I downloaded it, something happened. I I don't know. I don't know either. And it, certainly there were zeros in the first two minutes. And I was, you know, off the top of my head, I'm like, well, yeah, that's probably when I didn't have, you know, a good GPS signal. But then... 130 seconds later, I got something like this. But then if I do what, let's just make another tab. Shift and hold that down and I drag that over. Attitude, longitude. It's not, no, there it did, it did, it did, it did it that time. But that path is... Yep. Another thing you'll notice, it might be swapped X and Y, you know, the, the direction of it, you know, things like that are going to do funny things to you. Well, that's, I'm curious because let's swap it. You know, that's a little bit closer than to the shape of the sodom path. And you, you just have to go look at the values and say, well, latitude is actually the vertical, the vertical axis. And then longitude is the horizontal axis. So, you know, just says, says latitude and longitude doesn't necessarily mean X and Y. You have, you have to go look at them and figure out which ones they are. But So, I don't know if you can see that says X and Y. And this has latitude, longitude. I'm not... Do you think that could be my problem? Um, it, it's some, something to think about. I, I don't know that it's really a problem. Because what the, the, the outcome is, your final X, Y that you're plotting from your ODOM is, you know, that is what you want. So hopefully that's, you know, whatever translations you did, as long as it comes out looking right in your X, Y, that's probably, probably working right. Mm -hmm. So fix when you said you know go grab latitude and longitude. I this is there. I'm assuming it is about. Oh, well, cl close close this data and open the one that was said. Uh, oh, I don't remember what it was called. I think it was that one. Yeah, running over the same path. That was just a couple of days ago, right? You have the sixth. I, I like to say delete that data because I don't know I, I know what it does if you can't if you keep them both. And now you got these weird windows. In fact that that right there is that is that the one that is your latitude and longitude? There's the yeah, there, fixed, there's fixed that zero and forty that I was just complaining about. And this is the ODOM data, which obviously you can see I ran a different path. And um this is me in another part of the yard just driving manually. But that's completely rigged out. That's longitude. I'll open a new tab and replot your latitude and longitude just to see if it is something about your, your data. See, that's what I was seeing right there, that, that red thing. But that's not what it says on the left. It says it's got 
seems to have valid numbers in there. Unless, unless did, did you say delete the old data or not delete the old data? Just I, did, I said delete the old data. Close plot juggler completely and open it again just to make sure we don't have any extra garbage kicking around. And so fix is definitely screwed up in this. Um, so you get the zero and then it goes up to 40, but I didn't look at that in detail to see if it was varying at all. Um, so you can see the, the entire time there, it's either zero or it's 40. So that that's why I was saying before, you said, well, what about the rest of the time? Well, it was, that's what it was the whole time. So I don't know where those came from, you know, how you created that or. Maybe a driver wasn't running or something weird was happening. So if you if you plot out um, if, you, if you plot out your ODOM again. No, oh no, what, what I was thinking was you, you said here here you're you're driving up and down and you said over to the right, you're driving it manually. Well that's a case where you're driving manually up and down and if the pure pursuit was running then you could go you already have that data so you could go watch to see what the uh the steering angle and the let's see it yeah the the, the steering angle the pure pursuit is generating and you can look at the uh the um you know the the, the off track error yeah the benefit though of running over this path manually is that it's going to be calculating the off track error and whatnot on these points over here, I was not running a path. Oh, you don't have a path defined over there. Okay, so yeah, no, it's not gonna tell you what you need to know there. But that's, um, if I just, well, look at the timestamp on that. The timestamp is wigged out too. It's all in negative times. Very peculiar. Right there, it says forty point three four something. So it's not it's not just an integer number. It is a a decent value. But where's the zoom thing? Is that this? Uh like your oh that 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 always confuses me. I can never get that to work. I was gonna say maybe you can use your like your 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 scroll wheel. Does that work? It looks like a fixed number. Yeah, I don't know what was going on there. Or what I did to get different behavior with the most recent data. Mm. Because I mean, this all this data is GPS derived. And fix, I thought, came out of that Nemo. Um, it, it may have, as you say, the time was screwed up. So it could be that it's it's taking the time from a different plot. So you just you slid off the screen where you can't see see what's going on. And I I don't know how you adjust that, but there are some ways you can you can fix that. Somewhere there's probably a tab that says use this particular window as the, the main time base. And I don't know, I, I don't know how you do that, but that, that might explain why it's just simply got all this, all of this goes zero to eight hundred. So it seems like that's in the you know the right time frame you should be running in. So yeah, when I combine these and I try to plot both of them, I get this very peculiar time stamp. Go back to yesterday's data. It's got negative time in it too.
but it has positive time in it as well. I'm back in time. Hey, I've got a time machine. Yeah. Let's see what this does. Mm -hmm. That stays the same, but now oh, it's plotting. Uh, why do those two endpoints not come out at the same point? I assume the one at zero is where you started from your garage and moved out, and now you're coming back to a different point. Is that the same point at your garage, or is that something else? No, it's it's. Um, I get ODOM data up here. And maybe it's that thing where your your ODOM is sw the it's switching because the GPS fixes switching. Maybe that's part of it. And that yeah, that that might explain why you got negative time because. Oh, maybe I don't update time correctly anymore. Yeah, see, it's showing a gap too. And it's showing this time thing. Yeah, I, I that's got me baffled. I don't know what's causing that. So plot juggler is amazing. It can take things of different scales and different time values and line them all up. But I have no idea how it's doing that or. When it goes wrong, I don't know what to what to make of it. So, yeah, this is a little bit concerning. But I mean, at this point, here's the point where RTK fix is achieved, and I get a little bit of variation. Um, shouldn't lose. Well, we can plot it out. Let's see. I remember what topic was. Maybe five. I don't remember what to look. Hmm. It's showing We still had RTK there. That is um, backing into the garage, and that should come to zero zero. Another thing you could do to avoid some of this stuff is just simply drive your lawn tractor out, out into the yard where you know you're going to get a decent RTK fix. And if you need to be pointed in the right direction, so you need to be pointed down, you know, just drive out there and point your thing down and sit there and wait for it to start RTK fix and then start your software running. And that way, so you, you, on the right there, where you can see that it made that little jump as it, as it, it changed, just, just go out, you know, closer to the beginning of your, your path and drive the vehicle out there manually. And if you need to be pointing down and then point it down and then let it sit there until it says it's got RTK fix and then start your ROS program running and it'll start recording. That way you won't have it jumping back and forth on you like that. Unless, unless there's something I'm missing there. It could be that's not, not the best way to do that. <clears throat> 
Mm. You're right. That would be a good. Um... And speaking of the, the, the GPS fix, um, is it because your house is shadowing your GPS antenna or is it because your, your base station is, you're not getting communication between your base station and the, the vehicle? What, 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 what is cause, what is causing that? Or do you know? It's inside a garage surrounded by, you know, metal shelves. So it's not getting any decent uh, GPS signal inside the garage. But, oh, so you're not even starting outside of the garage. I, I thought you, I thought you're out in the park, out in your driveway when you started this thing. I didn't realize you're in your garage. I mean, I could change the origin point. The GPS to ODOM script, you know, has an offset when it calculates the when it goes lat long to X Y. It needs an origin. I mean, I could change that. Why? Well, I would think you just leave the origin the way it is, just simply start somewhere other, other than inside of your garage. I wouldn't think you'd have to start, you know, because once you define the origin, all these other points should still remain the same no matter where you're at. So it, it just seems like you should just be able to drive out in the yard and sit there and wait for the GPS to lock on and then go ahead and start it at that point. And I would think the the value should still be the same. Now, again, Again, I might be missing something there, but I think that is the case. Yeah, it's definitely something to test. So I got a robot that can't steer straight <laughs> on its own. And I've got one that's just sitting around doing nothing. So I, maybe I'll try harder. I, I was like, after the last meeting, I thought, oh, I'll go ahead and get this. Uh, computer put on the robot and take it out and drive it around and I, i've got an entire week now without getting anything done on it so actually i am to the point where i've got the pure pursuit loaded i got that translator loaded all i'd have to do is you know fire that up but when i fired it up i had no data because i had no no sensors running so there's no data into it so the, the next step will just be put put the thing on the robot and plug the two usb cables in and fire up the, the original launch file and that'll turn on all my sensors and start publishing all the data and I can start at pure pursuit and see. I, I'm just got to follow through and make sure all the, you know, the output of one goes to the input of the next one, make sure those all match. And then theoretically, I guess I would put it up on blocks, just sitting there on the floor, put a block in the back so the wheels turn, it's not going to go anywhere. And then I can want, I can either put the front end up on blocks or just leave the wheels on the, on the ground and let it turn back and forth. So I could actually, you know, before dragging it out in the yard and wasting all that time, I could just, you know, sitting right there on the floor I can verify this doing something, so that that would be a a good a good point to do that. You can get fixed inside the house. I I I can, and I may run it without any corrections. So speaking of fix, uh, what do you know about cell phones and viruses? Do you know anything about that? Uh, no, because you know in my world there were very few people who spend time writing viruses for cell phones, so. Never had to deal with it. When I when I went to look it up, somebody says, "Yeah, it's very unlikely you'll get a virus on an Android phone." But well, what happened was I I I signed up with Gmail and they screwed me on a whole bunch of things. And one of them is when I went into Gmail, they they kept taking half of my messages and calling them spam. And I couldn't figure out how to how to calm that down and make it behave. So I just went and wrote a script or wrote a a filter that says. You know, whatever comes in, assume it's not spam and put it right in the main folder. And I went with that quite a while. So then like a couple of weeks ago, might, might even been longer than that. I, I pulled up my mail and here's a, here's a message from Ron or something. I clicked on it and I was trying to scroll through and see what was going on. All of a sudden, bam, the thing reset back to the menu and it, it started doing all kinds of goofy stuff. So I don't know if it, you know, it was a, I don't know if it had a, a some kind of uh, a virus in that or, or what? So I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I just ignore it and move on, or if I have to worry about cleaning out the whole phone and doing something else. Because so speaking of correction data, I could just stick that on my robot and turn it on. That'll give me correction data. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to get a laptop in the house, connected to the internet, connected to a telemetry radio, put a telemetry radio on the robot. That would that would be correction data. So anyway, that that was another thing that was slowing me down. That I was just too lazy to go track that down. So I could go drive it with no fixed data and just drive around the yard, you know, with a less precise 
uh, path and see what it does. And that, that, that would be the quickest thing. So I don't have to fight with all this other stuff. But, so that's just another thing that I'm, I'm, I've been thinking about and it's been preventing me from doing anything because I didn't want to, didn't want to look into it. It's a pure guess on my part, but the behavior you exhibited, if I were just guessing, it would be, yes, that was a virus, but he had written it to attack a, a Windows machine and because you were running on a phone, his virus blew up. And it could could be that it, the, the virus is actually aimed at the browser that I'm using. So it, it could be that, you know, there still could be a problem there, even though it's not a Windows machine or a Linux machine. It's the fact that, you know, it's in it's it's attacking the browser itself. And I I actually on my phone, I don't even know how that I don't know if that's part, that might not even be part of a browser, but. I don't know. I'm thinking mm -hmm. about just deleting Gmail completely off my phone and then then maybe maybe that'll solve it. I think what happened on that, you know, if it if it declares something uh, as as spam, it will put it out in the spam folder and it disables the images and the links in the thing. But since I told it not to do that, all the links were available. So it could be just as I was scrolling through, I hit one of the links and that made it do something. So and again, there's just various things there that I've didn't know what to look at or didn't know how to track that down. So I've just been avoiding it up to this point. <laughs> I'm not sure what the implication, if I go out and run it without correction data, I might just be off by, you know, several feet one direction, as long as I have enough open space that that might work. So that that's something I, I could try that very quickly without, you know, without getting my correction data working, just go out and try it to verify it. it's going to try to follow a path or something. So that might be, might be worth trying. So I'll try to get around and do that. I'll plug it in. And so I'm getting data and try to try to get up to the point where that thinks it's working. And then, like we talked about before on the simulator, I might go through and say, okay, what would it take to make the simulator run closer to what you have right now? And we were talking before we started recording, and basically, the, the way it works right now, and the way that simulator got put together, it, it's got a fake GPS on the vehicle, and it is publishing latitude and longitude, but I don't think it's using that right now. It just shows up if you want to look at it. And instead, it's got a custom program written that says go out and read the the current position of the vehicle and converted that into an ODOM statement. So it's it's publishing ideal ODOM. It's not actually using the GPS. So I think it's just a matter of deleting or turning off that that uh, ODOM publisher and then put put Al's code or whoever code we want to use, you know, start up that so it's like a GPS to ODOM program and have it subscribe to the uh, latitude and longitude from the simulator and have it publish the ODOM, then it'll be working just like just like Al is running right now on his, or at least a lot closer. And there, there may be some reason why messages don't match or something, but but that would be something worth looking at because if we, if we can break the simulator to make it do what Al's thing is doing, and then we can then try to figure out why why it's doing that. And we, we can run it with the simulator and not have to drag everything outside to try all this stuff. So that's another thing. If I get around to it, I'll give that some more thought and see what, see what we can do on that. Cool. Well, I think we can turn off recording. Okay.